we're live. So, <laughs> we're there. so um, yeah, thank you again, obviously, for uh, taking the time out. I know, uh, you know, you have a busy schedule as always. And, um, you know, I wanted to be able to sit down with you and ask you a lot of questions and have some discussions, both um, you as, as a coach to professional uh, fighters, as a school owner, as a mentor, as a father, um, and um, hopefully have some um, valuable insights for myself, you know, <laughs> and uh, our students and some of the parents out there as well. So uh, just really quick uh, for anybody that's watching, um, I did post uh, to any of our current Gracie Baja students, I did post recently, uh, Professor and I did an interview about 18 months ago already, which is crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was the summer of 18. At uh, GB Princeton. At GB right? Princeton. And we did a whole long interview about your, your history uh, before Gracie Baja, growing up in Baja de Tijuca. And, um, you know, and then not only that, um, I know you just did a recent podcast with Elliot Marshall and yeah. dove even deeper into that, which I found really awesome. There's things that, um, that I learned that I never knew about you in terms of um, also just some of the other people and legends that were in Baja at the time when you were growing up. And it's like a who's who of Gracie Baja now, a you know? Special time for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, really cool, some other cool tidbits that I thought was awesome. So uh, those um, those interviews and those podcasts will be up on our site. I'll post those pretty soon. Um, so we're in your your new facility, mm -hmm. beautiful brand new facility. I know, I know. Our new facility. Our new facility, <laughs> thank you. And uh, I know, I know, it took a lot of uh, time and, and effort to get this place up, but it's uh, it's a beautiful place, and it's awesome to to see uh, everyone enjoying it. And um, so, you know, uh, one of the things that obviously I wanted to start off with was uh, you're still obviously coaching um, professional fighters, or you've been doing that now for twenty. Would you say about twenty years, even with Hen, you know, with Master Henzo? Yeah, back? the first. First person I ever coached, well, I didn't really coach him. I corner him was Henzo, and he taught me how to be a coach and a corner man by just being his coach and corner man. Yeah. He even would tell me, hey, you know, at this time of the fight, tell me this, tell me that. Um, so I really learned my trade. I guess, you know, Henzo had nobody around, and I was the one that he was beating up on on training, and we'd be getting ready for the fights together. And um, yeah, a lot of the times I would end up uh, in his corner trying to like being so nervous, not knowing what I would say. And, and he would, he would be fighting and also calm me down and remind me of the things that I needed to say. So yeah, I had, I had a lot of, a lot of patience and trust in me. I could, you know, I've, I've learned so much from that experience. And, and so obviously you, you continue to do so you've, you've brought on and coached uh, and still do coach a lot of pretty high profile fighters and, and, um, and, you know, guys I see now still here, obviously, like Frankie's really somebody that's been here for 10 years, probably with you. Yeah, I'm with 10 years. Now. Yeah. And uh, we know Corey has is, is got a big fight coming up this weekend. I'm sure you're getting ready to jump on a flight soon. And um, Eddie Alvarez and, and so many guys. And so seeing and I know that beyond those guys and the high profile guys that people hear about, there's so many other fighters that come in here and train, I know, and and get to learn from you. Um, and obviously also from a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu standpoint, a lot of world champions that have come through here, not only uh, under under you and under obviously Master Henzo, there's a lot of other guys out there within, I would say the association, the family there that are you know at the top of their game, guys like Gordon and Gary. And, yeah. um, and having spent so much time in you know, 20 plus years, whatever it may be, um, working with and seeing all of these people come through. Are there certain things that you pick up on that you see in fighters or, or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu athletes that kind of give you a sense of this person, you know, I think is going to have a long, steady career. You, you, maybe it's a sense of grit you see with them in terms of discipline. Are there certain things that you have identified that kind of give you an idea that this person's going to do pretty well um, in, in, in the sport? Yeah, you know, um, I mean, to do well in the sport, you know, like, what does that mean? You know what I mean? Like, for someone coming in that's never really, like, done anything, and then all of a sudden, you know, they could grapple, they're in the best shape of their life, they're having a ton of fun, they're part of a community of people that are like that also. I think that, you know, qualifies as doing well, you know? Yeah. Like, when we talk about 
the highest of the highest level, whether it's, you know, MMA, you know, the UFC, um, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competing like in world championships and, you know, and grappling and stuff like that. So the more the performance side of it, yeah. I think that I think that the the price of admission, there is a certain level of just genetics that it's to me, it's undeniable, you know, like you, you have just certain guys there, just like you can just look at them and, you know, it's like, it's like you look at a racehorse and you look <laughs> at a, a donkey, <laughs> you could pretty quickly tell the difference. Yeah. Maybe not just looking at it, but just, you know, if they go for a gallop, right. you could see this Arabian horse galloping and you could see a donkey trotting and it's a very big difference. Right. So I think that for, and it's for any sport. Yeah. You know I mean, I look at basketball, you know. Yeah. You know, you're not seeing six foot guys playing in the NBA. I mean, right. there's been a few, but the majority of the guys now over yeah. seven feet tall, you know. So there is there is a certain price of admission, uh, I feel. But um, talent and genetics are nothing without uh, hard work, you know, like, and, and I feel that the guys that I've either directly participated in their progress or I've watched them grow, you know, like as an example, a guy like Frankie, he came with me. He was he came to me. He was already in the UFC. You know, he wanted to improve his jiu-jitsu. Um, our first meet, he said that he wanted to be the UFC champion. It was back in 2008, first time I met him. And uh, two years later, he was the champion. But, you know, Frankie just has this legendary aura about him about his you know just his work rate and he, you know he has the most minutes fighting in the ufc the most striking most strikes landed in the ufc i think he's for sure like an immediate hall of famer as soon as he Definitely. retires but what people don't see is that that's something that he works on every day yeah you know I, mean? I remember the first time i went we went lifting with frankie you know frankie was like a 55er at the time now he's at 45 perhaps even going to 135 yeah and the first time we went lifting with him, he lifted more than everybody. He was freaking stronger than everybody. And he wasn't even close. And I just couldn't believe, you know, and and his work ethic, you know, come comes in early, you know, finishes all the practices. He just drills hard every practice. He's never fooling around. Like as soon as the as soon as it's time to work, it's time to work. You know, he likes having his fun too. So um and even if you ask Frankie, you know, like you probably like growing up like he wasn't necessarily the, the fastest or the strongest or or even the greatest wrestler but his work ethic man you know and just yeah. his his willingness to compete just loves competing yeah you know what i mean like it's not about necessarily winning it's about competing and winning uh to him and i think that's something that he works at every day you know yeah um and then I'll bring uh, the two, I call them boys, I call them kids, you know, Gary and Gordon. I met Gary, he was like 16 years old. I met Gordon through through Gary, you know. I've spent a lot more time with Gary than with Gordon. When Gordon, uh, when Gary was going to Rutgers University, <clears throat> he's a uh, Tom de Blas student. When he was going to Rutgers University, his home school was too far. So he would come down to my school, the old school in Hamilton, pretty often, you know, like a few times a yeah. week. And one of the things that you notice about Gary and Gordon, and I think this is true for almost everyone that becomes extraordinary, right? Like everyone that becomes yeah. world class, like it doesn't happen by chance. Like it doesn't happen because it was written in the stars. You know, it doesn't happen because it was their destiny. Is they took that thing into their own hands, and you know they worked very hard for it. There's a very uh, deliberate approach to becoming world class you know gary you know competed at every competition that he could possibly in you know he he would come in and, and take a ton of classes you know um he quickly got to a point where most people in a room wouldn't give him a hard time grappling wise so he'd come in and take the mma practices and now he's fighting MMA, but i don't think yeah. back then he even wanted to right he just wanted to come in and and mix it up with frankie and mix it up with the other guys and, and he would go to rutgers and wrestle with the wrestlers you know so he was always challenging himself uh giving himself opportunities to either test his will improve his skill and um yeah like everyone could say yeah i'm a tough guy yeah you're a tough guy until you're tired and when you're tired you just quit uh like your will 
and your toughness and your grit is not just something that you're born with. Yeah. Uh, I think some guys naturally have it more than others, but it's something that you work hard every day. And I think the same thing with Gordon, you know, like Gordon all of a sudden became this like overnight sensation, but man, this kid has a, this kid has a, as a purple belt, I remember him like in the Olympic rings, like doing like the the, the Iron Cross, whatever that thing's called. Man, like this kid's a freak. Like he's yeah. super flexible. He has incredible technique. He has like superhuman strength. Yeah. And he just kept working and working. You know, I remember them, you know, driving into the city six a.m. taking a class with John, and or hearing about, it, and then sleeping on the mats until noon, taking the noon class, and then yeah. coming home and and. Uh, teaching at New Brunswick and, you know, then, you know, training on themselves. And I think that's pretty much their lifestyle. Yeah. You know? So not everyone that lives their lifestyle is going to be world-class, but if you have that, you know, the genetic component and you start to work on the will and the skill, I think that, it, you know, if you spend enough time around world-class people doing world-class routines, like you become world-class yourself. And that's what I see happen with uh, Gordon and Gary. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I, and, uh, at I agree a thousand percent. And, uh, and one of the things that uh, I think that jujitsu has taught me and any of our other um, teammates here is, is, is watching guys like yourself and Frankie and um, a- anyone that came in and compete in terms of the level of commitment um, in, in that, that is the X factor to me. I, I agree a thousand percent. And I've, um, I've watched Gordon Moore uh, over the past couple of years and just have had such a profound respect for his work ethic and Gary's work ethic and, and seeing that. And like he, he, um, I don't think he gets enough credit sometimes for it. people like, you know, they try to think he's a fluke or they talk that he's like some kind of fluke, but the, you know what I mean? Like, and, and he gets all wrapped yeah, up I think in that, that stuff. You know, but it's, coming from, from a lot of the, you know, predominantly gee guys, like they resent, um, you know, Gordon's success, you know, yeah. they're just completely, um, completely threw upside down, like the dominance of the Brazilian guys, yeah. you know, and also just how colorful yeah, you know, yeah. Gary and Gordon are yeah, with yeah. their social media presence yeah. and some of the things they do, but Hey man, like they back it up. They do. You know? they do. Like, and, 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 and it had to be this way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's been such a, such a, a, a dominance in, in the performances and in the culture from, you know, the, the strictly gi, mostly Brazilian guys, you know, whereas now, only now you're starting to see some of the American guys like break that dominance and, and, and Gordon and Gary, like to, to throw that upside down and just to break that mold, they have to, yeah. it's a revolution. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, and then now you, know, you have, you know, JT Torres also, who's won like two ADCCs in a row. Like yeah. we're starting to have some incredible performances yeah. by non-Brazilians, but they're still rare. So I have yeah. no problem with them just kind of, you know, throwing that thing upside down. Like it really, yeah. it really pushes the growth of the sport without a doubt. Yeah, I, um, I agree. It's, it's been fun. It's been entertaining to watch. I have to say, it's really cool to watch each ADCC get bigger and bigger and bigger and there's more coverage and, and uh, it's exciting for the sport. And I think it's like a, I think it's an ecosystem at the end of the day, the more, um, the more you have guys that are competing at a high level and being entertaining and, and yeah, their, their colorful antics off the mats are, you know, people will have opinions about that and that's, you know, everyone can have their opinions, but it's garnering more and more interest. And I personally respect and admire that level of work ethic that I see that, that those guys put into it and, and understand that it is, you know, a, a large, large part of their success. Not only that, obviously their instructor, obviously their teammates. Yes. They have to have some level of talent to, to be able to get in there, but they're proving that what the formula is, I think. And just overall though, um, just seeing that, that level of popularity in, in the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu ecosystem grow is really exciting for me. And uh, one of the other things I thought was pretty cool, and I want to get your thoughts on this, because it's been, you know, it's been played with a little bit, is obviously a little bit of these crossover matches with wrestling. And it's two communities that obviously I think share a, a certain level of a certain base of skill set mm-hmm. and, and culture and everything else. Um, and I find it really exciting that there's starting to be just the very beginning of some mix over. And, and obviously there's always been, I'm sure as you know, as a school owner, 
students that come in that are adults that want to do jujitsu, they wrestled in high school or mm -hmm. whatever it is. And they're looking for that. Do you have any thoughts on seeing some of that, you know, now kind of from a, you know, um, competitive standpoint, some of these little, um, a mixed rule set type of things like where do you think that's going to go i i'm personally not a fan of like the the hybrid rules just because like at the end of the day if you want to decide you know if the wrestler is a better fighter than the jiu-jitsu guy there is no rule set yeah that will make it even actually there is you get in a fist fight and see who wins <laughs> you know right. like it's that's already true. like the mixed martial arts or the valley to do you know days of old and not you know and and each athlete is a different animal, you know what I mean? Like, so yeah, I think that it, when it comes to martial arts, right? Like if we start to escalate, like who is the better fighter, then just get in a, get in a fight and yeah. see who wins there. It's very easy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, how do you, how do you uh, measure, um, you know, a takedown versus a sweep, you know what I mean? Or, or, or a pin, which is, the end of a grappling the wrestling match right. versus a submission which is the end of a jiu-jitsu match right. you know what i mean like i think submitting someone is a much more complete win than just pinning someone but if you pin someone you could punch them an elbow in the face then you know maybe a pin is just as strong as a very good submission entry so i think that when it comes to that aspect of you know a jiu-jitsu guy versus a wrestler versus a sambo guy versus it's mma definitely. whatever we already have the <laughs> yeah. we already have the ultimate rule yeah. it's mma you know yeah what like, i what i, I would lo love to start seeing mma matches i don't know how that would be you know what mma matches like they're having these no time limits and you know guys fighting you know with a minimal right. amount of rules people are not you know you know they're not like biting each other they're not right, you know right. headbutting each other like a I minimal punch, amount of yeah. safety rules yeah uh yeah, do it here at the academy you know what i mean like do it somewhere you know i'd yeah. love to see that guys start arguing you know what i mean like let's put a couple of these cameras and let's stream it you know what i yeah. mean like if they want to make some money you know yeah. i'm sure a ton of people will pay to watch that yeah um, no time limit uh, but MMA yeah like price. i'm not you know i'm not interested in, you know, i i think that if a wrestler goes into the jiu-jitsu rules they're always going to get destroyed and if a, a jiu-jitsu guy goes into the wrestling rules they're always going to get destroyed and and you know what i mean like it's it's taking Usain Bolt versus Michael Phelps. Like, what are we going to do? Are we going to yeah. run in, you know, water to the waist? You know what I mean? Like, are we going to swim <laughs> in, a, in a really shallow pool? Yeah. It's like, you know. Yeah. My, uh, what I, what I like about it most, what I just found myself doing is it, it was exposing me to the world of wrestling a little bit more and in kind, what I liked about it, it was exposing more wrestlers who are just fans who are watching flow grappling, you know, they're watching the wrestling side of flow grappling, yeah. exposing them to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and seeing some of the similarities. But I, I agree with you in the sense of it's difficult to find a rule set that's going to really make a difference or actually even because there are the two very different sports. There are some similarities. Yeah. That's what I found the value in that I liked was that it was getting me interested in even like the world of wrestling and some of these top guys and just appreciating it. And, yeah. And knowing, at least for me, like wrestling for, from a no gi standpoint, I want to improve my stand up, and yeah. there's things you can learn from there. And then, likewise, as a as a school owner, as a steward of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, an ambassador, getting more and seeing more wrestling um, enthusiasts exposed to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and you know, maybe that starts to bring more yeah. people in as well. You know, there's there's that side, you know. Um... Yeah, I just like personally, like I'm not a huge fan of the hybrid rule. Yeah. Even ADCC is it's 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 enough of a great uh, it's enough of the ADCC rule set. Like to me, it's enough of a great medium. Yeah, we just don't get like the really high level wrestlers coming into ADCC right. for whatever reason right. because I think it's very wrestling oriented when you put the jiu-jitsu guys together. But if you bring bring a wrestler, it's still much more biased towards the sure. it's called submission yeah. wrestling for yeah. a reason, right? Like it's a lot more biased towards the guys with uh, jujitsu and you know submission background than yeah. than the wrestlers. But if you take a guy with a little bit of jujitsu, we've seen you know Nikki Ryan do it. We've seen uh, a couple of really good wrestlers do really well at ADCC with a, a very small, relative, small amount of skill development in jujitsu. You mean no. Nikki? Like you mean Nick Wyman. Rodriguez? You mean not Nikki Ryan? Sorry, Nikki yeah. Rodriguez. Yes, yeah. we've seen Nikki. Uh, Nick Rodriguez do really well. We've seen um, uh, Rinaldi. Yeah. Uh, 
also I think took Silver like back in the day. He was a wrestler. He actually came to help me for some fights. Uh, I think he wrestled for per Purdue. I don't know what he wrestled, but Frankie hooked me up with this guy. He was a really good wrestler. He was a Carl Pravex uh, student and incredible jujitsu. This guy. Yeah. And um, he took Silver ADCC. Chris Weidman took Silver. I think ADCC. He lost to Galvão in the final. So we've seen some wrestlers do yeah. really well. Yeah. Cool. Um, I want to I want to shift a little bit now over to um, you as a as a school owner. Um, obviously, celebrating twenty three years as uh, as RABJJ is twenty three years old. Ninety seven, you had your first you opened up the school. Yeah, I moved in ninety seven, and yeah, the the school started in ninety seven. So I mean, yeah, it's been you know over twenty years now. Yeah, and so obviously, I, I'm sure you've seen almost all of it in terms of types of students, struggles that students go through, older students, younger students, students looking to compete. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts and, and advice for some of uh, the students out there. Maybe they're new students, maybe they've been training for a while and they're hitting like a little bit of a plateau. Um, let's start first with um, live training and positional training for us is uh, where I see sometimes you know, people, um, you know, whether they might get hurt, uh, whether they might be a little bit of a, not tussle, but tempers flare a little bit. We always, uh, you know, every single role, we're trying to express the importance of protecting your partner and safety and everything else. And what is the context of the role in communicating with your partner? Um, do you have any general advice for students when they're first getting into live or positional training in terms of how to conduct them, themselves? Just certain rules and things you think they need to remember. Yeah, absolutely. I think that most people that when they first go into jujitsu school, if you realize like maybe the very first uh, five or six techniques they learn, right? Or especially like the first month, most of it is defensive, right? If you learn how to break fall, Right, so you fall without getting hurt. You learn how to, you learn how to, you know, do a technical lift, just standing up, you know, in proper base in a fight. Like you learn grip break, grip fighting. A lot of the techniques are one step self defense techniques, right? Like a, a, a wrist grab where the weakness of the grip is towards the thumb. Like a lot of, I believe Jiu Jitsu is defensive first. Um, and most people when they start live training, all they want to do is win. You know what I mean? Like all they want to do Eat is them. they want to they want to grab the basketball. They want to put it in the hoop. You right. know, like there is there is no concept or understanding or even reinforcement of defense. You know, and and that's not an easy thing to communicate. I've tried in the past few years to do a better job as an instructor to teach people how to how to look at rolling, and especially like when you first start training, you know. Typically, you're rolling with someone that's been training a lot longer than you, you know. So your goal is to defend, is not to attack. Like there, it's their move to attack. And a lot of times, when people are having a very difficult time, like when they're just kind of like being smashed and getting submitted over and over, is because they're not they're not seeing things coming. Like they're not seeing the offensive movements, the grips, the off balancing. So my recommendation is when someone starts rolling. It's so what I do when I'm coming coming in. I'm like, all right, this guy is good. I'm gonna train with this guy, you know, damn, you know, way younger than me. You know, like maybe I don't have the the gas to keep up for a long time. My first thought is defense first. Even when I compete, I've always had a very uh, I don't like losing, you know, like so I like to give myself a, every chance that I possibly can to win. So when I go into a jiu-jitsu competition now, it's masters division. It's five minute matches, in which is it's not enough time to get scored on and come back and make a mistake. And sometimes if you're being overly aggressive, you get scored, you know, you leave openings. If it's 10 minute matches, then you have a little bit more time. But my first thought is don't get scored. Like I'll, I'm, I'll gladly win by one score. I'll gladly win by one advantage if I don't get scored on because I gave my opponent no chance of beating me, you know? And jujitsu jiu is like that. It's very different than, you know, if you watch the UFC, like in the UFC, even in the scoring system, there is no points for defense. There's no points for I throw a punch and you block. Like that's what you're supposed to do. There is no points for I shoot for a takedown and you defend the person initiating offense in, in, in theory should always be winning. Okay. 
but here at the academy like my recommendation for longevity on the mats for because if you ask a black belt right like someone who just started rolling he goes man you know hey coach hey professor you know what should i do to get better and they're gonna say hey man just relax just slow down don't use so much strength probably like he 